The First World War has scorched its images into our memory as perhaps the most futile war in history. The killing, the blood, the mud, the trenches, the shells, the poison gas lasted from 1914 until 1918. It was the world's first experience of total war, the world's first experience of industrial war. Yet when the war began, tens of thousands in every country rushed to join the armed forces. Famously, the propaganda said the war would be over by Christmas. But of course it wasn't, and 15 million people never saw their home again. This edition of Timeline looks at the war that should never have been fought. On the 28th of June 1914, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie, were shot dead in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo by a nationalist Serbian student. It was the final trigger, though not the cause, of the First World War. The European powers, most of them still monarchies, were glued together in two competing alliances. Britain, France and Russia formed one bloc. Germany, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire formed another bloc that dominated the heart of Europe. Each bloc had colonies around the globe, and each was tied by diplomatic obligations to the smaller countries of Europe. So when, a month after the assassination of their emperor, Austria declared war on Serbia, Russia began a counter-mobilization. Germany then declared war on Russia and France. Then, on the 6th of August 1914, the British Empire declared war on Germany. On the Western Front, the Germans advanced to within a few miles of Paris, but were driven back by an Allied counterattack at Marne. The opposing sides then settled into trench warfare. On the Eastern Front, the Russian advance was checked by the Germans at the Battle of Tannenberg in East Prussia. By the 16th of September, all Germany's African colonies had surrendered to Allied forces. On the 1st of November, Turkey entered the war on the German side and attacked Russia in the Caucasus Mountains. The territory of countries now at war stretched from the Atlantic Ocean in the west to the Pacific in the east, from the Mediterranean in the south to the Baltic in the north. And the European colonial system meant that peoples with no direct interest in the struggle of the European powers were drawn into the conflict. The military leaders who went to war in 1914 were utterly unprepared for what the conflict would bring. The monarchs of Europe were bound together by ties of class and blood. Here's King Edward VII with Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II, his nephew just eight years before they went to war. Like the monarchs of Europe, the officer corps of the rival empires had more in common with each other than they did with the ordinary soldiers under their command. But the rival industrial empires pitted them against each other in a war just as rivalry for markets had pitted them against each other economically before the war. At first, workers enlisted in huge numbers as new popular newspapers transmitted a nationalist fervour from the political elite to ordinary citizens. But in the end, every nation resorted to conscription. France called up eight million men, a fifth of her entire population. In Germany, the total was 13 million. In Britain, five million with another 3.5 million added from Britain's empire. The armies they joined looked like they'd done in the 19th century. The German army boasted its Uhlans, the death's head hussars who still wore breastplates. The Austrian army looked magnificent in its pale blue and green and scarlet uniforms. The French infantry wore uniforms essentially unchanged since the days of Napoleon III. The heavy cavalry looked unchanged since the days of Napoleon Bonaparte. Yet the war turned into a very different struggle than the one the officers had imagined in their gentlemen's clubs and military academies. The growth of industry had transformed war, and war transformed each national industry into an arsenal. Mass artillery barrages, barbed wire, chemical gas, flamethrowers, machine guns, and later tanks dominated the battlefield. 
Massive battleships were hunted by submarines that transformed naval warfare. Zeppelins rained bombs on civilians from the air. Perhaps the last stand of the so-called noble individual combat was taking place with the newest of weapons, the fighter plane. The aces of the air counted their success in the number of individual kills. Germany's Baron Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, killed 80 before he was shot down at the age of 26. French ace George Gunnemir was himself shot down at the age of 23. The best known British ace, Albert Ball, shot down 43 Germans, but he died before his 21st birthday. But this war wasn't to be won or lost in the air, but on the ground. Germany needed a quick victory in France to avoid fighting on both the Western Front and, against Russia, on the Eastern Front. The plan for a swift advance through Belgium brought the Germans to within 50 kilometres of Paris, but it was halted in the Battle of the Marne. And then a very different war began. In the remaining months of 1914 alone, nearly one million Frenchmen were killed, wounded or captured. The following year, the number would be nearly one and a half million. In the second year of the war on the Western Front, there was offensive after offensive. But they all failed. Poison gas and chlorine were used for the first time during the Battle of Ypres in Belgium, during April and May. On the Eastern Front, the Russians were driven back and Germany occupied Poland. In the Middle East, the British Empire attacked the Turkish Empire in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. The attack failed. And the British failed again in the disastrous Gallipoli campaign. General Sir Ian Hamilton, sent to command the Allied forces, had five divisions to the Turks six. Only two were for Britain. One was from France, the rest came from countries far removed from the Europe where the war was fomented, Australia and New Zealand. The Turkish defenders had the advantage of the position of hills overlooking the landings. The Allies suffered heavy losses in establishing two precarious footholds. Their forces were some miles apart and the exposed beaches were poor places for landing men and supplies. In the end, those who survived had to be evacuated. The war spread to even more nations during 1915. Italy entered the war against Austria, mainly from the opportunist motive that her politicians thought she would end up on the winning side. But Bulgaria joined the Austria and German side. Nineteen sixteen saw some of the bloodiest battles of the war on the Western Front at Verdun and the Somme. Tanks were used for the first time. In one sector of the Verdun battlefield, 1,000 shells fell on every single square metre of ground. On the first day of fighting at the Somme, 60,000 British soldiers died. By the end of the battle, 415,000 British had died. The German casualties were so high that the method of announcing them to the German public was changed. It was all for nothing. More than a million lost their lives in this single battle, all for a few yards of ground gained or lost. To make sure that there was no dissonance at the home, Liberal leader David Lloyd George became Prime Minister of a coalition government of all three main parties. On the 31st of May, the long deferred confrontation of Germany's high seas fleet and Britain's Grand Fleet began. The Battle of Jutland is still history's biggest naval encounter. The British lost three battle cruisers, three cruisers, eight torpedo craft, and 6,274 officers and men. The Germans lost one bottle ship, one battle cruiser, four light cruisers, five torpedo craft, and 2,545 officers and men. Both sides claimed victory but the losses inflicted on Britain were not enough to affect the numerical superiority of their fleet over Germany in the North Sea.
February 1917, a light began to glimmer in the East. The Tsar of all the Russias was overthrown in revolution, but the provisional government of pro-capitalist politicians, soon to be supported by moderate socialists, vowed to keep Russia in the war. In April 1917, the United States entered the war. By the end of the following year, there were two million United States troops in Europe. American isolationism was over, and the rise of the US to global influence had begun. But the build-up of United States troops was too slow to halt the mounting discontent in the French army. In May, the French army on the Western Front mutinied. It refused to obey its officers, and it refused to take part in any more attacks. The mutiny ended the period where the French army served as the main Allied land force. Yet the bloodiest battles of the war were just about to take place at Ypres and Passchendaele. It lasted from July to November. The low-lying ground at Ypres was churned into a swamp by artillery fire. Tanks and guns sank. Troops waded forward in mud up to their knees, their thighs, their waists. By the time the British got to the village of Passchendaele, it was just a brick-coloured smudge on the ground. But a quarter of a million casualties had been the cost of capturing it. Something had to give, and it gave first on the Eastern Front. Russian troops were walking away from the front, and the army was in revolt against the war. In October, the Bolsheviks swept to power and began the process of taking their war-weary nation out of the war. It was the event that finally meant that the carnage was nearing its end. Partly encouraged by the October Revolution, willingness to fight evaporated in the Italian army. At Caporetto, the Italian army retreated 70 miles, and more than a quarter of a million Italian soldiers simply gave up fighting and were captured by the Austrians and Germans. On the 3rd of March 1918, the Bolsheviks kept their promise to take Russia out of the war as Leon Trotsky signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with Germany. On the Western Front, Germany began a final offensive which was to see it reach the Marne again by June. The Allied forces countered at the Battle of Amiens. At the end of the year, in a counter-attack against the Hindenburg Line, the British artillery fired over 2.2 million shells in a single week. Among the common soldiers on all sides, the feeling began to grow that they had more in common with each other than they did with the braying, patriotic politicians back home. The English officer Charles Carrington wrote, England was beastly in 1918. Envy, hatred, malice and all uncharitableness, fear and cruelty born of fear, seemed the dominant passions of the leaders of nations in those days. Only in the trenches, on both sides of no man's land, were chivalry and sweet reasonableness to be found. Then suddenly, revolution spread from Russia to Germany. Naval mutinies in Kiel and other cities led to the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II. The guns began to fall silent, and on the 11th of November 1918, the armistice was signed. Robert Graves, soldier and poet, was at his home in Wales. He wrote, The news sent me out walking alone, cursing and sobbing and thinking of the dead. The war started with workers rushing to the national flag, but it ended with the red flag flying in Russia and the Republican flag flying in Berlin. By the end of the war, age-old ruling families in Europe had vanished. Not only were the Romanovs gone from St. Petersburg, the Hohenzollerns in Berlin were gone. After six centuries, the Habsburgs were gone from Vienna, and the age-old Ottoman Turkish Empire had vanished. The peoples of Europe were settling accounts with the rulers who had taken them to war, and in the process, they were making peace possible. On the 18th of June 1919, the Peace Treaty of Versailles was signed. Although it was signed in the Hall of Mirrors in the old palace of the French monarchy, from which it took its name, it was actually negotiated in the previous five months in Paris. British diplomat Harold Nicholson hoped that the peace treaty would mean great, permanent and noble things. But by March 1919, he was writing in his diary, very tired, dispirited and uneasy. Are we making a good peace? Are we? Are we? <laughs>
they were not making a good peace. The last tragedy, one of the greatest tragedies of the war, was enacted at Versailles. And what tragedy could be as great as the war itself? Only this, that the end of the war was the prelude to a second world war. The broken nations of Europe began to compete and rebuild their empires, even before the memorials to the dead of the First World War were built. The ministers of old Europe went back to the old ways. In less than two decades, the second, even more bloody world war had begun. This has been Timeline, the First World War. first experience of industrial war. Yet when the war began, tens of thousands in every country rushed to join the armed forces. Famously, the propaganda said the war would be over by Christmas. But of course it wasn't, and 15 million people never saw their home again. This edition of Timeline looks at the war that should never have been fought. On the 28th of June 1914, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie, were shot dead in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo by a nationalist Serbian student. It was the final trigger, though not the cause, of the First World War. The European powers, most of them still monarchies, were glued together in two competing alliances. Britain, France and Russia formed one bloc. Germany, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire formed another bloc that dominated the heart of Europe. Each bloc had colonies around the globe, and each was tied by diplomatic obligations to the smaller countries of Europe. So when, a month after the assassination of their emperor, Austria declared war on Serbia, Russia began a counter-mobilization. The First World War has scorched its images into our memory as perhaps the most futile war in history. The killing, the blood, the mud, the trenches, the shells, the poison gas lasted from 1914 until 1918. It was the world's first experience of total war. The world Germany then declared war on Russia and France. Then, on the 6th of August 1914, the British Empire declared war on Germany. On the Western Front, the Germans advanced to within a few miles of Paris, but were driven back by an Allied counterattack at Marne. The opposing sides then settled into trench warfare. On the Eastern Front, the Russian advance was checked by the Germans at the Battle of Tannenberg in East Prussia.